Summer is over. Time to go after the hurricanes, massive forest fires, and other unpredictable events that happen this time of year. And meet my buddy, Mark Robinson, who has the most unusual story of how he got into storm chasing. So saddle up and come ride the winds of autumn. Hurricanes are the brass ring of storm chasing. They're the loudest, wettest, and the most dangerous weather events on Earth. George, move the truck! I'm chasing again this year with my good buddy, Mark Robinson, who's been with me on some of the wildest weather trips you can imagine, including Francis, Rita, and the mother of all hurricanes, Katrina. Now it's time to start going after this year's storms, starting with Ernesto, tracking up the Caribbean and threatening the eastern U.S. So I may end up flying into Miami um, tomorrow. But I can't get a flight out, which is incredibly frustrating. Well, bad news for me. It looks like the storm is going to hold tropical storm force strength across the Florida Straits. Then Florence, big and mean, moves across the Atlantic. The forecast track has this thing going right over top of Bermuda. I've never been to Bermuda before. How about tomorrow? This one looks like a winner, but once again, trying to get a flight into the eye of a hurricane is almost impossible. Global warming is heating up the oceans, spawning, it is believed, more and more violent hurricanes, whose effects are being felt as far north as the Great Lakes. Ernesto started off as a wave off the west coast of Africa, traveled all the way across the Atlantic, made a landfall in Florida, and then again in North Carolina. Whoa, and this is the wind, it's now on Lake Ontario. Surfers on Lake Erie, gales, this weather is nuts. This is a frost warning, <laughs> oh God. Mark helped me document some of the crazy weather that was hitting the Great Lakes. We've done a lot of chasing together in the last few years. Mark and I actually met through an online weather forum. It's a place where you know weather interested people get together and discuss forecasting and things like that. And uh, we really hit it off. A few months later, I ended up taking him with me on his very first uh, storm chasing trip to the central United States. It was his first time ever seeing these big supercell thunderstorms up close, and he was hooked right after that. This guy uh, was really enthusiastic, and that's what I liked about him. While we wait for a good storm to go after, I decide to check out some of my equipment at the NRC testing facility in Ottawa. Here, they test everything from aircraft design to ski jumping simulations, anything that requires incredibly fast wind speeds. This is a scale model of the actual wind tunnel here at the National Research Council, and the blades of this fan are absolutely humongous compared to me. This little guy down here represents my size, and I'm gonna be actually up here in the chamber receiving the full brunt of this fan. This is definitely one of the coolest machines I've ever seen. These huge fan blades are so well balanced that I can move this giant thing completely by hand and still be able to walk right through it. This is cool, I gotta get me one of these at home. I brought my anemometer and some safety gear to see how they perform in hurricane force winds.
Although I've been in many hurricanes, I've never been in a simulator like this. Okay. First time ever in a wind tunnel, this should be interesting. We're up at 30 kilometers an hour. We're up at 60. We're at 80 kilometers. Up 140. how real this feels. The water feels like millions of needles stabbing you all at once, just like in a real hurricane. That is extremely unpleasant. I got water in my goggles. Yeah, that's nasty. Hey Mark, it's George. Just was looking at the latest maps and uh, the NHC site actually has a bit of a further east track than the uh, Canadian Hurricane Center. And uh, be in touch first thing in the morning after the, uh, the latest update comes out. Well, it looks like I've probably got a hurricane I can sink my teeth into now. Hurricane Isaac has formed east of Bermuda and it's making a beeline for the Avalon Peninsula of Newfoundland right now, which is about an hour and a half, two hours from the main city of St. John's. You have to wait until the very last minute in order to make sure it's worthwhile to go to the storm, but if the airport is closed, you're out of luck. Mark is joining me on the Newfoundland chase. He arrives in his not-so-high-tech storm-chasing vehicle, which looks more like something out of a Mad Max movie. This is, this is my chase car. It's my chase vehicle. It's uh, got all sorts of stuff for chasing. Wind speed and direction. No, normally wind speed works really well, but it broke off this year. This is uh, some of my scanner antennas. It's got a sensor in there that does humidity and temperature in there. It's great. It works well when it's running. This is my incredibly high-tech anti-hum device. That's nice, Mark. But I think we'll take a plane. This uh, particular storm, Isaac, has been its kind of up and down. It's been changing its course. Slightly offshore, then onshore again, then offshore again, fluctuating in intensity. Basically, finally made the decision, okay, here we are, we're going, and now I'm on the plane, there's no turning back now unless the plane gets diverted, so I better not get diverted. Okay, we got a huge problem. We're literally circling St. John's Airport right now, and because of the storm, it looks like we're not going to be able to land, so they're talking about diverting us to Stephenville, which is on the other side of the island can't see anything. We're about to land in one of the world's stormiest airports in near zero visibility. We're attempting to land in St. John's, Newfoundland, the new home of Hurricane Isaac. Whenever you're dealing with weather, you're going to run into weather kicking your ass every now and then. And it's stressful. It's making me crazy. I don't know how we landed in this fog. I'm glad that we're here, though. Don't get me wrong. We made it. We've got to hustle if we're going to get to a good spot. Hey, Mark, where am I going? I need to. I know. We're looking for Gower. I can't. I can't see any street signs. This is awful. Can't see a thing. I'm at Cape Spear right now, and the lighthouse behind me marks the most easterly point of all of North America. Isaac is starting to make his appearance right now, and I can really hear the surf has picked up tremendously. And what I want to do is get down by the rocks, down by the water, and see exactly how much wave action there is going on right now. So we gear up and head into the pitch black.
can hear the waves pounding, but we can't see a thing. Right down by the danger zone, right on the rocks, right beside the ocean. I don't dare get any closer to the ocean than I am right now, because some huge waves pounding up here. If I go any further in, it'd be extremely unsafe. But that's my style. Whoa! As I almost fall into the sea. While Mark is exploring the rugged coastline, he gets a phone call with some bad news. Isaac is out to sea and accelerating. So, so what, it took a sharp right it took turn? A sharp right turn just before it made landfall. And we should have had it, it should have been right here on top of us right about now. And unfortunately, it's we off. have to be in England. It's off to, it's off to the east. It's off to the east. Well, that's pretty much that. Isaac has taken a sharp right turn and gone well out to sea. Uh, this is about as far east as you can get on the continent, so there's no way I can catch up to it. That's uh, as close as I'm going to be able to get. Uh, I would have liked to have for it to have been a lot stronger than that, but that's storm chasing. A few hours later, we watch Isaac sail out to sea. It's always disheartening to miss a storm, but for my chase buddy, it's a real test. You see, Mark got into storm chasing for the most unlikely reason. Well, depression's something I've been fighting for, it's been years. It's hard to put a beginning point to it. It definitely was the worst about six years ago. And uh, I got to the point where nothing gave me any enjoyment. I was doing nothing. It was, it was, it was really, really bad. Desperately looking for something to help focus his life, he turned to a most unusual therapy, bad weather. I'd always been interested in chasing and, and interested in storms, but I thought, you know, I, I gotta check this out. I just gotta see what this is like, you know, even though, you know, I, I didn't have any interest in doing anything. I sort of forced myself out one day and, and uh, got to this storm. All of a sudden, I sort of all of a sudden felt something again. It was just, it was sudden and sort of like, wow, this is, uh, this is something I gotta do again. So, after the usual initiation, Mark joined our crazy fraternity. Hey, Mark. Hmm? You having fun? Oh, yeah. And soon, he was encountering situations he never thought he could deal with. What's the matter, Mark? There's six feet of water in front of us. There's six feet of water behind us. There's six feet of water to the side of us, and there's about four feet of mud to the other side of us. Mm. We're stuck. Is this good? No. Including our infamous trip to Hurricane Katrina. A year later, while on a tornado chase, Mark and I went back to Gulfport, Mississippi, and the very spot where we spent our terrifying two days. It just blows me away to see this, see this place. I mean, we were, we were standing here there were, with there were, this much water. Uh, yeah, and I mean, the whole, the whole area right in here was all, like that, was, there was the courtyard, right? All the sculpture was in there, and yep. now it's just, I mean, it's all, it's bizarre to see it like this. I'm doing a radio show on my journey, on my journey through depression, and how chasing has allowed me to get through and really fight back against it. It's made all the difference in the world because I've got something to live for. It's, it's something incredible that I can do. It's something that not everybody would be willing to do with all the frustrations, with all the, the heartache that does come with chasing. Depression is not something that goes away. It's not a, it's not a cold where you get over it and you're, you feel fine again. It, it's something you, you fight every day. I'm out here, I'm experiencing this, you know, this journey out to here. The plane was frustrating, but that's part of it. It's all part of chasing, and I've come to accept that, you know, the frustrations are as exciting as the, as the actual storm itself. It all adds up to a passion in my life, and I wouldn't want to be without it.
What's next? Ontario's on fire, and I'm getting a front row seat. September isn't usually a peak forest fire season in northern Ontario, but this year, because it's been so dry and so hot, there's over 400 fires burning north of Lake Superior. I'm on an airstrip here right now in Thunder Bay, and the water bombers are getting fueled up and getting ready to take off. I'm going to be up in a helicopter filming the action from above. Should be an awesome day. All the indices are in place for big fires. Pretty straightforward. They're all color coded. After a safety briefing, our pilot takes me up for a quick orientation flight. Then into some regulation gear and off to the command center. Hello, Tag 137, Thunder Bay, go ahead. This is the main fire response command center here. Um, basically what these guys are doing is keeping track of where all the fires are, all the resources, the firefighters, the helicopters, the water bombers, everything. We've got the radio control room over here for all the telecommunications. It's all done from here. This is the brain center of the whole fire operations here at Thunder Bay. This is a war room, and these commanders make split-second decisions that affect property and lives. The team here direct an army of water bombers, helicopters, trucks, and ground crews, some on loan from other provinces, to try and fight the vast string of fires. This is just I get a briefing on the emergency and discover why the fire season is so extreme this year. So each one of these stars represents a, uh, a, a separate fire, right? Each one of these stars. Well, 2006 was a dry year right from the very start. And we've had a lot of fires. We've been dealing with the fire. This dry spell, this drought-like condition just kept worsening. And then what happened in early September was a lightning storm came through with thousands of lightning strikes. Warm, dry conditions, sparks in tinder dry forest has led us to experience extreme burning conditions. huge hub of activity here. There's helicopters constantly taking off and landing. And this whole operation here is just for stacking and organizing and cleaning all the hoses for the firemen to work. Fighting forest fires takes miles of hoses and a small army to maintain them. It's an endless cycle of drying, repairing, and redeploying equipment to the crews. They have an entire tower just for drying. So naturally, I have to climb up it. It's a good thing I'm not afraid of heights. Now, it's time to get into the action. Our job today is to guide the water bombers to their target, then find a place to set down and assess the situation from the ground. This is some of the most extreme flying you'll ever see. Nobody but the pilots are allowed on this aircraft, so this footage is very rare. Don't planes usually slow down during landings? Imagine flying this huge plane at over 100 knots, inches off the water, then picking up a swimming pool and safely dropping it over an inferno over and over again. Now it's time to get on the ground and nice and close to the fires. Then we get involved in one of the craziest things I've ever seen done in the air. We've just landed in the middle of a raging forest fire to get a closer look. We're actually right here at the fire line. We had to land the helicopter in the road, and that's really the only way to get to this fire. This is about as close as we can safely get. Luckily, we have an escape route here with this road that we just landed on. I go deep into the forest to hang with an attack crew that's been fighting the fire line now for 72 hours. This fire here is Thunder Bay 246, and we've been here now three days. And uh, when we first got here, uh, the fire was just out of control. 
and I believe that part of the fire is still out of control. Romeo, how are you guys making out there with the chainsaw work? We gotta, we gotta pull back a few times because the fire is just too hot. This is very unusual for this time of year. Never be uphill from the fire because it can actually go faster uphill than it can downhill. And we just got word on the radio that the water bombers are coming back here. So it's time to uh, get out of Dodge and not get sandwiched between the fire and the water bombers. Sometimes you have to start a fire to stop one. Believe it or not, we're gonna take this huge barrel of gelled aircraft fuel, hang it from a helicopter, fly over the blaze, and set the forest on fire. These flying flamethrowers are headed right into the inferno. Of course I'm going. The smoke and heat are so intense. Yeah, look at good. This may seem like madness, but this technique actually saves property, forests, and sometimes lives. These controlled burns are an attempt to cut off the fire's fuel supply and hopefully stop it in its tracks. The hurricanes and fires of autumn are over. Now it's time to see what the winter winds blow my way. 